What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Tony. And I'm Mariana. And the fitness industry right now, it's not that great. It's become something built on unrealistic expectations, aesthetics, and external validation. Everything directing attention away from what actually matters. The bottom line is we're not just trying to provide another fitness podcast, but completely change the fitness industry for the better by giving you the knowledge and tools so you have the confidence in applying the best possible training and nutrition into your own life. Where today we are talking about what happens when you need or are forced to take time off the gym. I just had surgery this past Saturday and I'm not gonna be able to work out for a full month. So today we're gonna take you through every last thing that I'm gonna be doing and what you would need to do from a diet, a lifestyle, a movement, a supplemental point of view to make sure that you hold on to as much muscle strength and progress as you can when you need to take time off along with the psychological side of all of it messing with your head along the way and as always the easiest and freest way you can support this show is to take the next 15 seconds unless you're driving wait till you're at a red light to go leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you are listening to us on and if you're on spotify you can even hit that follow button in the upper left corner to make sure every single Monday when we drop a new episode, it pops right up on your homepage so you don't miss a thing. And if you want more after each episode, you can join us on Fitness Stuff Premium for just $5 a month where you get access to all of our complete 12-week training programs, which are trackable and programmed out to progressive overload in Google Sheets so you can keep track to guarantee you're making progress. You also get a bonus episode every single Friday where we answer your own questions and other great perks like exclusive discounts, downloads, and more. And you can go ahead and sign up in the show notes below. And before we get into it, as always, a quick shout out to our sponsor, Legion Athletics. Our day ones, our rider dies. If you need to re-up on any of your protein powder, your pre-workout, I really like their fish oil. Their magnesium is also great. My mom actually just got their magnesium and she's been saying she's been sleeping so much better, which it's just my mom. And I feel like she listens to anything I tell her, but she's like obsessed with it. She's like, I want you to tell everyone how much I love it. So my mom endorses if that, if that helps anything. Mrs. Moore. I was honestly just looking at their protein powder flavors and there are so many that I haven't tried before. And I think I want to try their cocoa cereal I've never had before. And because they do a 100% money back guarantee like i think that's a great time to try and expand your flavors because i'll hyper fixate on protein powder flavors and not get something new for Same. so that's also a great opportunity there to try things new and you can use the legion link in the show notes below or type in fspod at checkout to get 20 percent off your first order or double points on every order after that what's your goaded flavor their honey cereal ever since it used to be their salted caramel but then Bro, the salted car, I think it's their best seller. I don't get it. I don't think it tastes that good, to be honest. If you're listening to this and you love it, more power to you. I'm with you, though. That honey cereal is goaded. I love it because I love salted caramel, but I feel like it's not one that everyone gravitates towards just in general for flavors of anything. I'm going to be dead honest. I've only tried it once, though. So maybe that's why. So I actually, you guys heard that I just had surgery about an hour after Mariana did. I forgot to tell you yeah, yeah. I had no clue. We were planning out a different episode. I texted her. I was like, hey, I'm getting a ton of questions. I put it up on my Instagram. If it'd be something that people would want to hear more about, if I documented what I'm going to be doing post-surgery while I can't lift to mitigate any loss of progress. So I texted her yesterday. I'm like, yeah, a lot of people are interested in this. Should we do this? She's like, you freaking had surgery? <laughs> yeah, my bad. I forgot to tell and you. And I don't, it. I still don't know uh, in detail. This is going to be my first time hearing about it. Yeah. So, so y'all heard actually probably an hour before my end. So don't ever say you don't mean anything to me. That was my bad. No. So I had surgery this past Saturday. It wasn't like a massive invasive surgery, but I can't lift for a full 30 days after it's done. And I know a lot of people were messaging me about just I feel like a, everyone has maybe once a year, once every couple of years, a time period where they can't work out, w whether it's because of an injury or surgery, maybe they had a new kid, they're transitioning into a new job, they're moving, they're traveling. Something I feel like comes up every one to two years that causes you to miss more than just a few workouts. Mm -hmm. Does that happen to you? Do you think that ha I feel like that happens to most people? Yeah. It, I mean, it used to happen to me like way more because I used to get overuse injuries all the time, which I don't anymore. Yeah. Now, I really only notice it like when I go on vacation, but 
I personally think traveling is different. Like if you have to travel for work and whatnot. But when I'm on vacation, I don't give up because I never go on vacation. So that oh, yeah. doesn't stress me out. And also I'm too busy or like I'm just like having a good time. But yeah, I used to get injured Same. a lot. Yeah, because we're not talking about, just to clarify for this episode, we're not talking about if you're going on vacation for a week, if you're just missing a few days here and there to the gym. That's not what we're talking about in today's episode. And I think like for an example, I know a lot of people, especially I struggled with this when I was younger and was going to the gym six, seven days a week sometimes is you got to realize when you zoom out, your progress isn't as meaningful as you think sometimes, or like the loss or the strides you can make in a short period of time. And I always use that example of if you could clone yourself and you have clone A and clone B and you're going on vacation for a full week. And a lot of people get stressed. Like, should I bring my food scale? Should I find a gym on Yelp? Should I go drive? Should I skip out on the fun? It's like, no, you're on vacation for a few days. You should have some freaking fun. If clone A went off the freaking rails on vacation, didn't work out once, didn't sleep, binge drank alcohol, ate out every single meal, and clone B was the person who sucked the fun out of everything, brought their food scale to the restaurant, making the hibachi chef. <laughs> Can you weigh that, that fried rice for no. me? They were out of gym on Yelp. They drove 25 minutes, whatever. And like, if you look at those two clones and they come back home from that vacation, and if they just both get back on track, neither one of them overcompensates and does extra workouts or extra dieting, just gets back on track. If you fast forward even two to three months, I promise you, if you put those two clones next to each other and they've been doing the exact same thing other than that one week, you could not tell a physical difference between them under a microscope. You couldn't. Just three months from now, it's not going to matter because a lot of people get so stressed over a long weekend vacation. Yeah. You know, or a week or I mean, two, it starts to get up there. But you know what I'm saying? Like, we're not talking about just missing a few days here and there. Uh, and, unless that's a constant thing every other week. That's one thing. But I feel like people stress about that stuff so much. Oh, my God. I used to be that person. I used to be psychotic. Anytime I would do any sort of trip with my family, anyone, like the first thing I would look into is like, where's the nearest gym? What are what's like? How much am I going to be moving? Oh, my God. I specifically remember going to Montreal one year for a long weekend. We're in Montreal for like four days with my family and I paid $50 every all of those four days to go to a gym and I would wake up before everyone else at the ass crack of dawn before we did things so I could go to the gym. I would walk there alone in Montreal and go to it. Like what? I think that's a lot of people though. I mean, I used to do it. I would find a gym. I wouldn't eat out. I would do this. And now I'm at the point in my life where I'm like, it's so funny just looking at it, but that's a lot of people. Yeah. And that used to be me. That, yeah, that used to be you. So we're going to talk about how long you can take off the gym before you do start to lose muscle, you start to lose strength. We're going to talk about how long that takes to get back, what you can do in the meantime to extend how long that period is, and a whole lot of other things. And for reference, what I can do, because I got this sexy little leg thing You're on. You're not going to put your leg up on the which table? Is, no, but more because I feel like it actually might hurt myself. Ooh, what did you uh, done? Did you just say it? And no, I, I had a... It's going out. No, I, I was... So I had a small treatment called sclerotherapy. I think it's one of two treatments I'm going to have to have. But I have these things called varicose veins in my legs. Did you see them? My mom Could you done. see those? I know exactly what you had. Done. Okay. Yeah. Okay, because there's multiple different treatments for this type of vein, but I had them like bad, bad. I don't know if you saw it because I feel like when we were together in aloe, Did I, I was notice? wearing jeans most of the time. I don't even know if I noticed. Uh, probably not because I was wearing like long pants, but these have been gnarly and they're genetic for the most part. And I've had them since I was about 16 years old and they've been worsening and worsening. And essentially what varicose veins come from, and a lot of people confuse them with spider veins, which are more like the smaller miscolored veins. But varicose veins, these are larger. They come out of your legs a little bit. And they happen because I, I find this so freaking interesting is obviously your heart's beating blood through your entire body, right? Up and down, big old highway, just shooting that thing around. But gravity still exists. Right, even in your body, even in your blood. So even though your heart's pumping your blood, gravity's constantly pulling it down. So your heart pumps it, and in your legs, where a lot of blood is being pulled down to, you have these little valves in all of your veins. And in between beats, the valves close, and then they open when it beats blood through again. So all the blood doesn't fall back down, sinking to the bottom half of your body in between beats. And these veins happen because these valves break, essentially. They die, they break, whatever reason it might be. This blew my mind. When I went in, I had to get a, uh, what's the thing pregnant ladies do? Ultrasound. Ultrasound. I had to get an ultrasound of these veins so they could check them out. 
I did not realize how tiny these valves were, how small and de delicate they were. These things are like smaller than a hair on your head. Yeah. In your veins. It blew my mind. And I was talking to him like, how do more people not break these? He's like, well, this could have been weird. Did you play any physical sports as a kid that involved hitting your legs? I'm like, yeah, I played the cross. Like you're just beating Oh my God, you guys do with the metal sticks. He's like, it's genetic, but that probably honestly made it. Yeah. You just get, my shins have like bumps on them still just because of how much they got beat up. But like, these are the size of hairs. And, and once they're broken, you can't just fix them. Like they don't come back, unfortunately. And it is more of a genetic thing. But anywho, since these valves are broken, as your heart beats the blood up, it sinks back down into between beats and it kind of presses out and pulls in these veins. So I had, I know there's a lot of different treatments to get these out. Old school stuff looks medieval. Like they yank them out of your body. Like they literally pull it out like a snake. I'm like, what? No. Because in my head, my stupid head, I'm like, so I'm a little confused here, doc. If you take the vein away, like, where's the blood going to go? Isn't it there for a reason? He's like, it'll just go somewhere else through another vein. I'm like, yeah. oh, I, I mean, I guess that makes sense. I thought our body was a little like, I didn't know you could just take things away like that. But I guess it's like your appendix too. Like you just take it away and be okay. Yeah. But I had something called sclerotherapy, which is where they go into those veins and they inject this solution that essentially self, it induces a blood clot causing these veins to collapse in on themselves and close up. There's like three different ways to do it, but that's the way we chose it. But anywho, I have to wear this super compressed leg thing with like these pads in it. It looks like I got a calf implant. I was telling you that it's hilarious looking for 30 days for the first seven days. I can't even take it off when I sleep or shower. And the doctor's like, yo, I'm like, what, what do I do if I'm dirty? He's like, just put a trash bag on it. I get home, I like try to put my trash bag on it. It goes up to my freaking knee. I go to Albertsons, I'm like limping over there. I get the biggest trash bags. Yeah. They still don't go up to my, I guess I have long legs. They still didn't go up. So I'm sitting here like, what was that kid's name in Charlie Brown that just walked around with a dirt cloud? I have no idea. I think his name was Pigpen. And he just like walked around with dirt. I'm trying to think of what I did when I That's had a cast I on my foot. I, I th definitely just wrapped a trash bag around it and it got gross, but. Yeah, and I'm someone who showers like once to twice a day. I'm weird. I like to be clean. So I went like 36 hours before I could finally shower. I felt disgusting. So anywho, part of the recovery, I can't do anything big. And a lot of these things that we're going to talk about from like what you can do to mitigate all this stuff that we're going to get into from a movement standpoint specifically, because we're going to talk about a lot of different dieting methods, some supplemental and some movement based. I think that's where most people are going to be limited because it really depends why you are taking yeah. times off. Are you completely bedridden? Can you get up and walk around? Are you in a wheelchair? I feel like that's where people are going to have the most variety. So that's where we're going to talk a little bit about it more. But first, I think the question goes really to like, how fast do you really lose your progress? Because I know in most people's heads, right? Like it's it, the, the second you walk out the gym, it feels like you're smaller. Oh, yeah. At least for like bros. Yeah. No. Like Jim Bros, I remember that's how I used to feel. Like if I don't work out for one day, I lose my pump, but I'm small forever. Yeah, I feel like there's that. And then there's also like the fear of like, oh my God, if I don't go to the gym for two days in a row, I'm going to gain weight. I feel like it's both like I'm going to gain weight or I'm going to lose muscle, like are the biggest. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So how long can you take off the gym before you start to lose muscle is the big piece of this. Now, Anyone who's built muscle knows that it's really hard and it takes a really long time. And the good news is once your body gets it, it doesn't really want to let go, right? It was hard to get. It doesn't want to let go. But after enough time off the gym, there is a point where your body does start losing it. And there's actually been a few studies looking to find exactly where this point was. And they found that when you are completely detrained, meaning no training or workouts of any kind, that it still takes at least two to three weeks before you just start to see muscle loss. And the initial muscle you lose, I always like to tell people this, like the, the initial muscle that you do lose probably isn't even actual muscle tissue, just the water and carbs that get stored inside of your muscle that makes you appear smaller when you miss a few workouts. Not because you're losing actual muscle tissue, just the size is going down. But that comes back after two to three workouts. And we're gonna talk about something called muscle memory a little bit later, which I think is super, super cool. Have you dug into that too much? I have just like a little bit, not a deep dive, but I'm very familiar with it. I'm on like surface level. I know that you can put on muscle faster than you initially started like in the beginning, right? Is that kind of like the 
I th- yeah, I think it's so freaking cool, so, which it's basically it's the physical changes that your muscles go through when you're gaining muscle the first time that stay in each muscle cell even after you lose muscle size. So it does make it a lot easier to rebuild muscle that you've already had than it was to build in the first place. But we'll go into like exactly how that works later. So at least I think that should de-stress some people is if you're off for a week, and that's why we're not talking about the vacation for a week or the few days off here for a long weekend, is your body won't start to lose muscle for a long, long time. At least a few weeks if you're not completely bedridden and immobile that we'll talk about. And the last piece I want to cover before we go into the different things that you can do to actually mitigate this is there's a difference between muscle and strength. And I know a lot of people might hear that and say, okay, but why do I lose strength when I go back into the gym? I don't know. Do you ever feel that when you take even just like a week off of training? Yeah. That you notice the first few workouts back just feel a little awkward. Yeah. And you feel like you can't move right. Weights are wobbly. They just feel a little weaker. Mm-hmm. Do you notice that? Oh my gosh. I was going to say in the beginning, like that's always the hardest part for me is physically, like anytime I go for more than a week off, I start to not feel like myself. Like my body doesn't feel like it's working as it optimally does. Like it just feels a little bit more stiff and sluggish and I feel more fatigued. I, that, okay. That's probably the bigger ego check is not the size thing when you look in the mirror, but you try and put on the same weight you were lifting before and your body's yeah. just like, nope, can't do it. Like <laughs> nice freaking try. No, no chance. That's the bigger ego check to me. I don't know about you. Yeah. It hurts. It hurts. But all of those things, I mean, you do go in. This is a known thing. You go in, it feels awkward. You can't get the movements right. It feels more wobbly than usual. You feel weaker. All of this reason that you have lost strength. But that's not necessarily the case. And I think that comes back to really understanding the difference between strength and size or why you can see like a seemingly skinny looking dude deadlifting 700 pounds. And then looked over and see a jacked bodybuilder with five times the muscle still struggling with half of that weight. Have you heard of, I, I'm going to screw his name up, but he's one of my favorite people on, online right now. Vladimir Shmo, Shmo, Shmodenko. What is he? Totally, he's this dude. What does he do? Who, he, he fakes his accent and he puts a janitor's full suit on and walks around gyms with a mop. He looks pretty skinny and he'll go up to these monster looking bodybuilders. I'm talking yoked wife beaters on and he goes up to him you need to look this up and if if you're at home look it up to vladimir and then just do janitor and i promise it'll pop up and he's in this janitor clothes and these guys are deadlifting like 400 pounds 500 pounds and this skinny dude in a little hat and janitor thing comes up he's like "Uh, oh can i do that or or he's like you're doing it wrong he like uses this funny accent and the bodybuilders laugh at him they're like okay bro you're gonna hurt yourself don't do it he's like oh can i try and he goes up and he just starts repping out their like one rep maxes like it's the easiest thing in the world. It's the funniest thing to me. I've never. He's seen a power him lifter. He just hilarious. does this undercover. I, I'll send you some afterwards. I, yeah, it's, I see it. He, that's he kills so me. funny. You got to hear it with the accent too, because that's what makes it. Oh my goodness! Honestly, that's what makes it. I'm gonna watch it after. Yeah, save that. But strength has more to do with something called your mind muscle connection, or the actual firing from your brain telling what muscle and what motor units and what muscle fibers need to contract at what time and at what effort all in sync and why strength at least in my opinion i think a lot of others should be thought of as much of a skill as riding a bike as learning the piano as anything else it's just as technical of a skill especially for compound movements like multi-joint movements like a deadlift a squat a bench press than just muscle size like the bigger muscles you have the greater potential for strength you have but that doesn't always mean the more strength And in one of the largest and most extensive views on this specific topic from AUT, University of New Zealand, they found that experienced weightlifters can maintain their strength after a complete three-week break from lifting, and then it really took a full five to six weeks for their strength to just start declining. And that does look to be true in newer lifters too. So when you feel a little awkward for your first couple workouts back, think of it like if you practice tennis or golf or any other technical skill. Think if you practice that thing every single day for an hour and then you take a few weeks off, the first time you do it, like if you're serving for tennis, you're going to screw up some serves. It's not going to feel natural. That doesn't mean you lost the skill. You're not as good. You're not as strong. Your brain just hasn't been training every day like it has been. So you haven't lost the strength. That's usually just something that takes a few workouts to come back into. When I really think about it, strength is so fascinating to me. And it might feel oh, so, so cool. dumb, but if it was true, right, if you had just more muscle mass than the next person, then you were automatically stronger. 
Like I think about that with tall people. Like there's just like like tall people are gonna they're gonna have more like surface area that muscle covers, and so like they could put on more muscle mm. mass. But you could have some like little bodybuilder who is just like five times stronger than a super tall like Jack dude. The concept of that, I love it. And it's cool. I love it. It's because most people, yeah, most people just think like the bigger you look, the stronger you must be. Yeah. And that's why I love that those janitor videos. It cracks me up because it's so much more of a skill than people realize. And it's not like muscle has nothing to do with it. No, the size of your muscle has a lot to do with yeah, it. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it cracks me up. So anywho, realistic timeline. We're still looking at this. My scenario, a lot of people's scenario. You're like, okay, cool. So that still puts me past the brink of losing muscle, losing strength regardless of how long that takes, but at least it sets some realistic expectations. Now, if you've got to take longer than that off, months away from the gym, more than that for a few weeks, and you want to hold on to whatever gains and muscle and strength that you do have, you can take at least a few weeks off without any major consequences. But if you're willing to put in, and I'm talking just a tad bit, a little bit of effort, a smidge, you can maintain your muscle and strength for several months without a problem. Okay, like this process is not nearly as hard as you might think, but you do have to do, and there's about three to four steps that we're going to talk about today in order to do that. And I think this is going to be even an order of importance too. They're all important, but there's small things that we can do. Let's start off with, what do you think number one is? Number one is eating enough to maintain your weight. So this is where you will find a lot of people when they have to take a prolonged period of time off, that's when you'll start to stress even more about food because because one, you have just like more time to think about it. And also I feel like when you are working out, you structure a lot of how you're eating around your workouts. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's for most people, even if they don't realize it, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just something that becomes typically more forefront of mind and always eating food is so important for putting on muscle and any physique related goals. But this is like your nutrition just becomes even more important somehow, if that's even possible, now that you're not working out. There's typically this idea that taking time off or not working out automatically means like you have to eat less, significantly less. Or like that's just something people will fall towards is, well, now because I'm not working out, I definitely can't eat as much food, which goes into the stigma that exercise burns all of these calories and allows you to eat more with mm. totally different comfort. But if you really make the right food choices while you're healing from an injury or taking time off, you would like, like we said, it's going to take like the three week mark is when you're going to start to see those changes in, in muscle mass, but you can mitigate that, like how fast that change happens. And a lot of that, that is through nutrition, which is why I would say that this is going to be like the most important, in my opinion, because even when you can't work out, the same principles of energy balance still apply. However, what's really important to think about is where were you in your phase of working out? Were you in a bulking phase? Were you trying to put on muscle mm -hmm. mass? Were you trying to lose fat? Were you in a calorie deficit or were you in a maintenance phase? So what you really want to do is now adjust your calorie intake to be at a maintenance level. So that means you have an equal balance between how many calories you're eating versus the amount of calories that you are expending. So say, for example, which I think this is going to apply to a lot of, maybe a lot of people, if you're in a deficit, like if you're in a calorie deficit, we have to go get surgery or you're going to be not going to have a gym for three weeks, what have you, you do not want to continue to eat in a deficit. You want to eat maintenance calories. So you want to adjust your calorie intake so that you're eating at maintenance. We, you still want to preserve your muscle mass. If you are not working out and you are also eating in a deficit, that's going to accelerate the rate that you lose muscle at because you're not doing anything to build muscle. So you do not want to be in a deficit. And, and some people think that that is like, some people will make their deficit even bigger. Is that is. Yeah. Well, they're like, I'm not doing anything. Might as well just turn this into a fat loss fix. Yeah. Go into it. Yeah. A lot of people think that way. Yeah. So if you're, if you continue to eat a deficit, you're going to really run the risk of losing too much muscle mass and you can accelerate that rate of muscle mass loss. And if you continue to eat vice versa, say you're in a bulking phase, 
if you continue to eat in a surplus, you're going to run the risk of putting on more body fat because you're not going to be putting on any muscle. You're not going to be strength training to put on muscle. So we want to preserve that muscle mass by eating maintenance calories. And we have our calorie calculator on our website. That's going to be helpful because your activity level is going to change. So your maintenance while yeah. you're working out is going to be different than your maintenance while you're not working out. So you can factor that in if you go onto our website, use the calorie calculator. Yeah. What, what do we, what's our name for it? Yeah. TDE, the week calorie TDE calculator, yeah. which is nice because here's where I personally struggled with that because I was, I just started a mini cut about a month ago. And I was in a deficit. I was lifting weights five days a week, about an hour in the mornings, Monday through Friday. And my deficit was around 2,800 calories. Now, once I was transitioning and I was tracking leading into it, because I don't track year round, but if I'm ever going into a deficit to line up my food, or in this case, to make sure I knew where I was going into this switch, it was different because I knew that I was going to be burning a lot less throughout each day. Mm -hmm. So my maintenance, my TDE was going down, but I also knew that my other outside daily activities, at least after the first few days, like for at least my particular case, walking is really, really good because the, the only negative downside that could come with not recovering correctly, if I'm not moving and getting blood flow correctly, one of the pieces of that vein could essentially break off and clot into a deep vein. And that's where it could break off, go to my lungs, okay. rip, Tony. So not a good thing. So they want you to walk as much as you can throughout the day after you first recover. Okay. And we're going to talk about that in the movement piece, but that's where it was difficult for me initially to guess where my new maintenance was going to be was because I'm like, oh, I'm going to be moving more throughout the rest of my day, but I'm also going to be moving a lot less because I don't have that hour 15 ish every morning of higher intensity exercise. So you can use a calculator like that, which is a good thing, but just because your body's ability to build and maintain muscle is so strongly affected by how much you eat for this first week that I'm in, I'm making sure that I'm consistent AF with my intake. So I'm guessing right now, I didn't change my intake. I stayed at about 2,800 calories and I'm hoping that's going to do it. And for seven days, I'm stepping on the scale every single morning to make sure I'm maintaining that week. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably going to do that, honestly, for the first two weeks, because I know I'm going to lose a little bit of water retention, just not lifting every day, too. So it might go down a little bit. I just want to make sure it's not trending down. Yeah. Because that's what most people don't realize. Like the three biggest stimulus stimuli that are going to help you preserve muscle during a fat loss phase are your calorie intake, your protein intake and weightlifting. So when you completely remove arguably the most important stimulus for holding on to muscle during a deficit, you're just going to be speeding up how fast you're losing muscle if you continue to try and lose weight, which is frustrating to hear for people. Cause if you're on this like longer weight loss goal and you've got a long way to go and you've already gone a long way, taking a month long, two month long, three month long break sucks, but you don't realize how much of a hole you could be digging yourself. If you continue losing a lot of muscle along with that, like how much harder was it going to be to continue making progress afterwards? If you're just losing some really hard to get lean muscle in the first place. Like it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, tough. that's huge. And going into the next point, which is eating enough protein. So this one, I feel like there's going to be a few different takes on this, but if you are before you go into your time off, either or eating a deficit or a surplus and strength training, like either a deficit or a surplus, either of those combined with strength training to be more specific, sorry. That is going to increase your body's mm. protein need across the board. So if you're no longer strength training and you are eating at maintenance, which we just established before, your protein needs are going to decrease compared to if you were in a fat loss phase or a bulking phase. So you can, I like some recommendations say to eat between like 0.8 grams and one gram of protein per pound of body weight. And the higher side is typically recommended just because there's no like negative effects of having too much protein. But I would even say this is going to depend on why you're taking time off too. So like if you are having surgery and there's like a part of your body that you can barely use at all, like I would say protein needs are like you definitely want to stay on that higher end because so it's going to kind of depend. I don't know what your take on this. Well, I, I thought it was interesting because I actually lined up because I'm like in both a calorie restriction or calorie deficit when you're eating less food and weightlifting, those two things both increase your body's need for protein yeah. in your diet. So when you take one of those two things away, 
technically your body would need less protein than before. Yeah. Right. That's how it should look. And I, I think when I found it, when I was putting this together for myself, recommendations drop to around 0.6 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight per day. But I'm I've seen you. that too. That's why, but I thought it's too low. There's other research that does indicate higher intakes might be a little bit better. And I'm like, honestly, the cost of eating too much protein is a lot less than eating too. Low. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not for me, at least I'm eating around 200 grams of protein. I weigh about 215, 220 pounds. I've been eating that much for a long time now. So where that's not brutal and so, so freaking hard for me to hit. So I'm like, I'm just, I don't see a reason why I would change that because it's fit into my life already. Yeah. And yeah, it's the, the, just the cost of eating too much is a lot less than eating too little. Yeah. So I'm with you. I think technically you could get away with less, but if you really, in my opinion, want to do everything you can, I'm with you. I think you sway towards the higher end of that. Yeah, the higher end. And also like the, I really see the only point in actually going through the trouble to like try and do less protein is if you're finding your appetite is significantly decreased. It can swing on either end of the spectrum. Some people, if they stop working out, their yeah. appetite, they're much more aware of it. And they eat more. Some people, because they're not working out, their appetite is decreased significantly. In that case, if you are in that camp, this is where it could be helpful because eating a ton of protein, it's going to be a little bit harder to do. It is very yeah. satiating. That's why it's very helpful. And it's going to keep you full and satisfied. But if you still can't eat that, hit that target you used to be able to hit just because you're physically like full, you can't do it, you can tee it back a bit. And that's where I see it making the most sense. Yeah. That's where I'm like, it's, since it's not hard for me to eat that much, I don't you see a reason to change it. If I was like that, where, yeah, I was stuffed after like 150, 160, I'd make sure that that was a good place yeah. to be. And if you're like a little confused with all the numbers we're throwing, like Sorry. 0.6 to 0.8 to one point, whatever. Because I'm thinking of that doing help. That's why we made, again, free protein calculator, calorie, calorie calculator too. Usually we base like the normal range, like 0.8 to 1.2 grams per pound of lean body mass, not just body weight. And you can use that calculation. It takes like 10 seconds online to figure out mm. where you should be. And I think we're both in accordance there. Yeah. So we want to sway towards the higher end. If you're really doing everything you can to mitigate loss, do that. Yeah. And just one more note on nutrition before we get into the next point. Some people will also look at if you can't go to the gym for, say, a month, like, as just a, like, what's even the point? And that is absolutely never the mindset you want to have. Because how many times have we said, like, nutrition, your diet, that is the biggest component of all of your health and fitness goals, physique goals. Like, if you're not paying attention to diet, yeah, if you're a newbie, you can still make newbie gains by lifting. You are not going to reach anywhere near your full potential if you're not paying attention to diet. It still matters. And actually, if you're not paying attention to it at all, especially if it's a recovery piece, like if you are coming off a surgery or an injury, like diet is so important for optimal recovery as well. So don't look at it as just this like free for all and I'll get back to it after because it's kind of That is a big piece of psychology of it though. Because I didn't really think about that until you just brought it up. A, a lot of what motivates me to eat super well is what I've been learning. I just didn't realize it until you put that together. <laughs> is if I have a killer workout, I don't even notice if I had a great workout that morning versus like a, a mid crappy lift. Yeah, I'll be way more motivated to like stick tight on my diet, to not veer off path and not go get the treats, whatever. I'm way more motivated when I get a great lift in the morning, even compared to when I get a bad lift mm -hmm. in the morning. Yeah, I'm like, oh, what does it matter? Like I barely lifted, I barely got a pump, I barely did this. It's all stupid and it's in my head. Yeah, But that's a big piece of it. Cause when you let go of that structure, I feel like a lot of people's brains and psychology work in that way where that like pillar of structure if you take that away you start to lose structure everywhere else mm -hmm. your diet your sleep you're like who cares it's a month it's yeah you see it as a month off yeah almost it's like i can do whatever i want that is a hard part because you got to find it's even like you said more important yeah not just as or, or equally it's more mm -hmm. important while you're taking time off i think we're going to predict a lot of things i'm going to run into a lot of problems i'm going to run into in the next few weeks this is only a, a weekend i'm like this ain't that bad this ain't that bad but i'm like oh my brain's starting to teeter now the third piece before we get into potential supplementation that i think might have a role as well this one is i want to hear your take on it because after putting all this together and looking at it all i would almost rank this as the most important piece to a t but this is also where people vary the most and this is how active you are because i know some people if you're injured 
like for me, I just had surgery on my leg. I can still walk a lot through the day. I can't lift weights. Here was also the thing, my nurse, well, I was like, I was, I, I'm taking this serious because like the, the worst case is a blood clot. So I'm like, hey, I don't want that to happen. When you say don't like lift any weights, does that mean like a little bit of that? She's like, just nothing heavy. And I want my brain in my head. I'm like, ma'am, I, I did the 405 pounds. I think my heavy and your heavy are a little bit different. What do you mean? She's like, just 20 pounds is probably the limit. I'm like, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm like, what I don't know if 20 pounds is that. Based off of what? Yeah. So I was like, uh, but I'm following it serious. I'd rather, I'd way rather just take a month of, of going too late and not just die yeah. from his leg. But this is where so many people vary because some people are on crutches. Some people can walk a lot. Some people, if it's, you know what I'm saying? Like are limited to upper or just lower body. Yeah. Some people are just traveling a lot to where they can work out, but just only once every week or every other week. Mm -hmm. So this is varying quite a bit, but let's just start here, right? The cool part is that strength training isn't the only kind of exercise that can maintain muscle mass. I want to make that clear, right? Strength training is not the only kind of activity you can do to maintain muscle. And I think it's understated how much daily activities like walking, doing the dishes, carrying groceries, small stuff like that provides so much more of a muscle building stimulus than most people realize. And I know a lot of people are going to roll their eyes at that. But this is why when you look at very sedentary, very obese individuals, and all they do is they start walking more each day, their body will go through a measurable recomp phase. Mm -hmm. They will build significant muscle and lose fat and weight at the same time. They will build measurable muscle mass and lean tissue just by walking, by never picking up a weight because that's more of a stimulus than most people realize. So if you do have to stop lifting weights, but you can maintain your daily activity levels, you can hold on to muscle reasonably well. And this is just keeping it real. If you're stuck in a bed hospital and you're bedridden, one, DM us. I want to say what up. Because that'd be kind of cool. You're in a hospital bed. You're listening to us. That's cool. I hope your day's going well. You got a nice nurse. But that's where being bedridden can be a potential problem. Because when in cases, at least that I was reading through, where people are completely immobilized, they can lose up to 5 to 10% of their muscle mass over the course of just two weeks, being completely immobile. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all of those small daily movements, they really do add up to more stimulus than most people realize. I mean, that's what we talk about when it's just like how closely step count is related to all cause mortality, how long you live. If you stop m using something completely, your body has no reason to hold on to it. Yep. Okay. So the second you stop using something completely, your body's like, oh, I guess we just don't really need to hold on to this anymore. It, it takes up excess energy. It's not good from a survival point of view. Why spend all this extra energy on something we do not use? Use it. So thing. even walking. It's called. Exactly. Like it's such a cheesy saying, but it's, it's so true. freaking true. So at the end of the day, the more active you are, the better you'll maintain muscle mass during your break. Now, here's where I'm probably going to get, I'm hoping that nurse isn't listening to this podcast right now. She said 20 pounds. So I ordered some 20 pound dumbbells on freaking Amazon. And I even like actually wrote out and structured some small 15 minute, twice a day, little like upper body, more arm focused workouts. Cause she said nothing on your core, nothing on your legs in this time period, but I'm going to be walking probably 12,000 steps a day as much as I can, as long as I still feel good with it. I'm going to be using this, but even if you have resistance bands that you could go through for a few minutes, a few times per day, just putting some sort of tension on each muscle group can go so far, mm -hmm. can go so, so far. So that's where I'm like, if you're taking time off, in a long period, and if it's for travel where you can't have weights or no access to a gym or whatever, but you can still do something, I know, just kind of like you said, like the F it all with the diet point of view, when you're taking time off, I know if you're used to doing 60, 90 minute, two hour long weight training sessions multiple days a week, that five minutes a couple times a day with some mini bands of some like shoulder extensions, some curls, some push ups, stuff like that seems like a waste of time. I promise you, it goes so much further than you think. So much further than you think. And if you're in a position where you're taking more than a month off, but you still might have access to a gym here or there, doing at least one structured lift or weightlifting session per week is enough to hold on to your muscle for up to eight weeks longer than that before you start to go downhill. Mm -hmm. And even after at least most data that I've read, you can reduce your total training volume to about a third to a ninth of what it 
normally is and maintain that for, I mean, essentially indefinitely. Meaning if you usually do nine sets a week on your chest and you do one to three sets per week, you can maintain how much muscle you have on your chest indefinitely as you go on. So even if you're here now and you're like, ah, oh, do I really, it's one workout I haven't worked out in two or three weeks. I'm not going to work out again for another week or two. Do it. <laughs> like it's so understated. This is what we're talking about. The small things that add up. Like we're not asking you to move a freaking mountain. Adding a few minutes a day intentionally with these things, with your diet, with your movement, with your lifestyle can be the difference of you kind of melting away over time and you really maintaining. So your starting point is not as far back as you think. Yeah. That's huge. That's absolutely huge. But the, see what I'm saying? Now I want to hear your take a little bit on it because that's where I'm like people who are bedridden, no matter what their diet supplementation looks like, start to regress really, really fast yeah. compared to even just slightly active. Yeah. Which I guess is not fast for most people. No, it just accelerates the rate of muscle cell atrophy. Like that is, it's what happens. And you see it in, it's one of the like leading cause of death, leading causes of death in hospital patients who are neglected so they don't have proper bedside care. So like say you're if you're in a long-term like healthcare facility, if you're staying in the hospital, if you don't have a caretaker that is prioritizing your movement, you're increasing increasing your rate of early death because of that. And not it's not like death related to whatever disease you had going on. It's the lack of muscle mass and that acceleration you see it in the elderly all the time it's actually really sad and it is when you think about it because this is not something people are going to think about often but the muscles you have to recruit to just even keep you standing up straight obviously it's passive it's a passive muscle contraction but you are recruiting your muscles to walk you are recruiting your muscles and just think about that and Versus just nothing at all. That's it just makes that makes so much sense as to why moving is going to be so much better for your overall recovery process and holding on to muscle mass because you're at it's just recruiting muscle fibers, muscle cells and that causing that contraction to happen versus literally not at all. And it's also for your mental health. Just it's, it's oh, if you yeah. can't lift. It's like walking is going to become your new best friend for sure. If I couldn't walk, then I think the psych like the psychological impact of this would be even greater. Well, if I couldn't be hitting for sure. Every day. I was telling Tony I've had so many injuries and comparing my I had shoulder shoulder surgery back to back and I had that done versus when I had a herniated disc in in my back. My herniated disc, I was bedridden. Like couldn't even walk, couldn't even move. My shoulder, mm -hmm. I couldn't I yeah, I couldn't lift or anything, but I could still walk. I could still walk. My mental health and also the my ability to get back into the gym and like progress was so much better with my shoulder versus my herniated disc. I felt like I was starting at square one. I can see that. So I can see it's that. a huge difference. Back injuries are the worst. Ugh. Like those just knock you out. Those seem like the yeah. worst. And and even think about this, even if you can walk, like we talked about that in the recovery episode. This is not just from a, a recovery from a hard lift your sore standpoint, walking is one of the best things you can do just to actively improve your recovery. So if you have an injury, even in your shoulder, something that improves your circulation, your blood flow, more nutrients getting to that injury site, usually the better your recovery is compared to just sitting still, which can make it so much worse. Uh, how many now, steps a day do you usually get before? I take my aura ring off in the gym. Mm -hmm. I don't lift with it. So I don't count the steps that are in that lift, which would probably be close to like 2000. Before that, I get around 9,000 a okay. day is what it tracks out to. So probably like nine to 11,000. And now I'm up to 12, which is not like a huge jump, which is why I'm not adjusting my calories for it yet. I, I think that's honestly, I go more insane when I can't get in daily movement than when I can't get a lift session. But I walk like between 15 and 20,000 steps a day. So I walk oh my God. so much. So I go, I just feel like I go stir crazy when I can't. 20,000 steps a day. Oh my God. I get that when I'm at like a music festival or Vegas in New York or like a big walking city. 20. And I have to put my feet in an ice bath when I get home. Cause I'm like, there's 0% chance I walk tomorrow. It's literally uh, so because if I do that, like I go on walks with my dog, I go for like walk in the morning. Like I walk throughout the day, but it is because at seven o'clock, like after dinner, 
I hop on my walking pad with my book and like two and a half, three hours will pass. And I'm like, what? Oh, I forgot you told me about that. And I'm, if you could just get lost. It is, like that, that yeah, I used to get between like 10 and 15. And now since I've gotten a walking pad, but also because I have my Kindle, it's crazy. I go into a different universe. I don't even know. I need to. No, I'm not going to get a walking pad. Get a walking pad. I've heard everyone that gets a walking pad says it's a game changer. It's the best. I might. My brain can't focus on things if I'm moving. Like if I'm trying to read or edit or anything, if my vision is bouncing up and down, it just doesn't work for me. I I don't know how you read a book. I read, I'll edit. Which I guess. Well, I use my Kindle. So like when I'm on the walking paddle, I have my Kindle or I will edit on my phone. You're just built different. Or maybe I'm just built different as in like incorrectly. I think that's maybe what it is. (laughs) That's definitely what it is. Now, let's say you can't move. You are bedridden. Now, from a supplemental point of view, before we get into how to get back into the gym, how quickly you can build it back, this muscle memory aspect and the psychology of it. As always, when we're recommending supplements or any piece of that, realize that this is the last piece of the puzzle. If you're not staying active, if you're not eating enough protein, if you're not eating enough total food, these will do nearly nothing. Okay, so do not ever think these are more important, even close. Like, get out of here. If if that is, you just skip this section, do yourself a favor if you do. But there's two in particular that I'm going to keep taking. I mean, that's three on top of my normal ones, like my magnesium, my vitamin D is my protein powder is staying in there each day. That's staying in there just to hit my help. Daily protein goal. Creatine, I'm not taking off. I'm keeping that in there because there hasn't been a ton of research on its help with muscle atrophy, but it is in older adults, especially mostly showing because of the strength aspect that it does help prevent muscle loss. So I'm keeping creatine in the normal cycle every day, five grams. I'm actually doing like eight grams, but that's every day. I'm not taking that out because I'm not lifting. I know a lot of people would do that. The other one that I've talked about before, more specifically in terms of when you're training in a fasted state. So when you're exercising, lifting in a fasted state is HMB, which is a metabolite of the amino acid leucine. And a metabolite is just, it's a metabolic byproduct from another process in the body. In this instance, leucine, the amino acid. And yeah, we've talked about it before in the context of taking it before fasted training sessions, because it's, it seems to be much better than taking just leucine itself, BCAAs, anything else. And this is in a fasted setting. Okay. I never recommend it if you're not fasted. Like if you have a a meal before you go work out, you do not need this supplement. But if you're fasted, like I usually wake up at like five something in the morning, I do not want to scarf down some food. I will throw it up. So I just pop a couple pills of HMB, about one to three grams before I go in. And it's really good at preventing muscle breakdown, which can be very high during a fasted training session. But there also is a lot of the data that was studied to kind of help me get to that conclusion about taking it in a fasted state shows that especially in bed rest periods or in low calorie intake periods, like cancer recovery, that taking three grams a day is actually really good at preventing lean body mass loss. And in, in this particular studies, it was split up into two doses a day, 1.5 grams early on and later in the day. I'm taking a little bit more than that because again, the cost of taking too much is not nearly as much as taking too little. It's more of a safety net of what I'm taking as soon as I wake up and as soon like before I'm going to bed is I'm taking about two grams each there. There's not a massive database on this, but there's even, I mean, there's just been some nice studies in bed rest where we were talking about earlier losing five to 10% of your muscle mass in as little as two weeks, where it's been studied more in the short term of two weeks or less, but where you negate any muscle loss when you separate groups into taking HMB compared to the group who isn't, who's losing significant amounts that quickly. So I think it's an interesting one that I'm adding in. I'm not banking on it. It's a safety net. Yeah, And it's like $15 on Amazon for a 90 day supply. So if this was something stupid, expensive, a hundred percent, I would not be doing this. It's 15 bucks for like 90 days supply. So I've been taking that as soon as I wake up and go to bed. I don't think this is necessary, but again, I want to prioritize this. Mm-hmm. So like any little bit that might help, I'm going to do a little bit. Yeah. But I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I've never heard about We've that. We've talked about that before, but not too much. It's a good one. It's just HMB on Amazon, taking a few in the morning and night. Now let's talk about. Muscle memory, all right? You get to go back to the gym. (laughs) Maybe that's you. You got one more week and you can lift again. Or you're coming to the complete of PT. You're doing all this. So let's talk about how fast you can build muscle, build strength when you're coming back. 
And this muscle memory thing, a lot of people are like, what is that is even real? It's not just gym lore. Gym lore. Okay. It's scientifically verified phenomenon. Now, what it is, it's an interesting little fact about muscle cells themselves that we alluded to earlier. Muscle cells are much larger than most other cells in your body. Fun fact. A lot of people don't know that. And they're also one of only a few of something called multi-nuclear cells in your body, meaning they don't just contain one nucleus, but many. And as you overload your muscle by lifting weights over years and growing bigger muscles, new nuclei are added to the muscle cells, right? New nuclei. Come on. So the more you grow muscle, the more you will have and find in, in those cells. And this is a large part of what makes them and lets them grow bigger and bigger. Now, the number of nuclei within the muscle fibers is actually, I would say, one of the more important factors that regulates muscle size as a whole. And when you take an extended break from the gym and you do end up losing muscle size, these are coming back down to normal, the nuclei you added during the training period beforehand are still retained for months and months and some evidence showing forever mm -hmm. after you stop training. I think that's so freaking cool. That, that lifting weights can permanently alter the physiology of muscle fibers. I think that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. But that's why. Okay, so you have all these little extra little powerhouses. I know it's, it shouldn't use powerhouse when we're talking about cells. <laughs> People are going to get mad at me for that. My Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. But these little machines just churning for muscle size, that means that when you start going back in, regaining muscle and strength that you have once had does happen a lot quicker than it took to build in the first place because you still have all those physiological changes that have happened in the past that are still there. The muscle size might have gone down, but the things that you gained, the friends you made along the way, those are still there. Those are still there. And I think that's so interesting. Now, I've never personally taken this long off the gym before, a full month since I started when I was in my teens. But now I don't think I've taken a full month off before, but I've had friends and worked with clients that have had to take months off from an injury or something else and have, at least at the rate that I've seen from what some friends who've been gone to as well, gained back what they have lost at nearly two to three times as fast as they did to initially get it in the first place. And this is even after sometimes a year off of lifting, how quickly it bounces back. So I think that's something super helpful in knowing like, shit, maybe you did lose some progress. If you've had it before, it's not going to take as long to get back there. Yeah. I think that's comforting to hear sometimes. Yeah, me too. I don't and think anyone talks cool. about it enough. No, I don't think people talk about this enough. And I think another aspect, it, let me know, this is something that just cooked in my head. Let me know if this makes cooking. sense. Cooking. Is I'm wondering, you know how when you learn to ride a bike, you never forget. No one learns how to, no, no one forgets how to ride a bike. Yeah. You might feel if you, like, I guarantee I haven't ridden a bike now that I'm thinking about it in, holy crap, like years. But if I just got on one, it would probably feel weird. I'm not going to fall over. It's going to feel a little wiggly at first, but I would still get it. I'm also wondering if the neurological adaptations, I guess this would depend on how long you've been off. Yeah are still there because the first time you go into the gym, like, you know, form is just going to suck because your muscles have no clue what they're doing. Right. So when you're doing a bigger movement, when you first go in, it looks ridiculous. It feels ridiculous. You don't know how to fire and contract and recruit the right muscle yeah. at the right time and when to let go. But after you learn that, I'm wondering if that would also help you more quickly overload your muscle coming back. I feel like that would. Yeah. I mean, it's the same with skiing. I think about it with skiing all the because I don't ride bikes much, really, at all. But, sorry. But I ski, like, twice a year. And I've gone two years without skiing, and I yeah. hop right back on. And it's like, by, I just need a day. I still remember how to ski. I still know how to ski, exactly. And I'll feel... Like, kick the rest off, and you're good by Like, I'm too. a million times better by the end of the day than it was at the beginning of the day. Yeah, you, you also have your, in your long-term memory, you have stored how to do that specific skill in your long-term memory. It's stored there. You know yeah. how to do it. It doesn't just dis disappear. So I think it's cool Absolutely. that muscle memory is actually a thing. It's not just gym lore. I'm going to start saying that more because you validated that I used it right. Okay. Before we go into these psychological aspects, which I think are bigger than most people realize how much your mindset's going to F with you when you're taking time off the gym. When you do get back in, I want to touch on this. There's a, let's say right and wrong way 
but there's a really good way to start working out again when you've had time off. And there's a way that's probably going to bite you in the butt. There, that's a, there is a when right you, and wrong way to do it. Okay, right and wrong. Like, it, it, wrong it doesn't mean you, you're going to just die, right? But it's going to make your life a lot harder. Like when you do get back to the gym, I think your first inkling and your itch is going to be just to jump right back into your old workout routine. Nothing happened, but that's just not the best idea. And a little warm-up phase is going to be best. And I'll give you like the outline of what that looks like real quick. The reason why, though, is that your muscles have become much more sensitive to the effects of weightlifting that you've taken time off. And this comes with pros and cons. On one hand, you'll quickly gain back any strength and muscle that you've lost, right? We just talked about that. That's a pro. But on the other hand, your muscles are also going to be a lot more susceptible to muscle damage. And you can get sore as a mother. Okay. Mm. And you're going to risk... Your risk of injury just goes through the freaking roof. How sore you're going to be for days and then training sore and then potentially ruining it and really elongating and stretching that out. It can really mess with you going back into it. Okay. Like the, the goal that I always give, and this is whether you've taken a month off, six months off, if you've taken years off, it might be different. But the main goal during your first one to two weeks back in the gym, that's it. One to two weeks should be just to train just enough to improve your muscles ability to resist soreness. And to improve your technique, right? Get the little wobbles out, get the rust out. For the first one to two weeks, you shouldn't be trying to pound your muscles into the ground, not be able to walk for a few days. You want to coach your body up to be able to resist soreness and improve your technique. Okay, so for the first one to two weeks, if you're impatient, just do one, but you'll probably feel a lot better and make a lot quicker progress doing two weeks. Use lighter weights than you're used to. Stay about four to five reps away from failure, especially on compound lifts like squats and bench press. So you're not going to be shaking those last few reps and do one to two less sets per exercise for the first couple of weeks back. Meaning if you normally do four sets of each exercise in a workout, just do two or three. Okay. If you do three sets normally, just do one or two. And it sounds silly. It sounds like a waste of time, but that'll acclimate your muscles. So you come back a lot stronger the next week, not weaker and more immobilized. Okay, so that's the right way to ramp on, ramp off. Obviously, if you're taking like years off, it's going to take a little bit longer than just a few weeks to build back up, probably do a different training, but don't just jump into it. I know your ego is going to want to, but that's it. Now, let's talk about psychology because this is the big piece. I talked to my friend Patrick, who just had to take a month off from a hernia. Mm -hmm. If you're someone who's active and goes to the gym often, your mindset's going to F with you. Yeah. When you take this much time off the gym, like it's going to mess with you taking this much time off from a few different reasons. So, and we both struggle with this. I mean, what was the longest you've taken off? You'd say like normal training again. Oh, fully three months, I'd say is the longest. Yeah. Three, that's a long freaking, like it's enough time for like your nor like your new life to become mostly normal. Yeah. Oh, it, it messed so hard with my head. Still now I have to put in the work to remind myself. So I don't plummet so that I don't go into this spiral of losing myself and feeling, I don't know, because working out is just a part of me and I lose it. And I'm like, I still have to put into wor the work to make sure it doesn't affect me as much. Because how many people use it for stress relief mm -hmm. to as honestly like a mental health coping mechanism? Yeah. yeah. And here's why I'm kind of honestly glad, like going into this, I was trying to predict what I would experience taking time off. And it's only a month. I know a lot of people have had it a lot worse. I'm not complaining about it in any way. Okay. Oh. But in this time off, I'm like, what could I experience? Because I don't know. I've never been through it before. I've never walked the path. So what could I experience? And what I had realized, at least in a certain point in my life, and a lot of people, at least for me, I don't know about you, I don't like to be 100% reliant on anything. I don't want to be attached or reliant on anything. That's why when I was younger, my caffeine intake got too high and I could not function without a certain amount of caffeine. I was like, I got to pump the brakes. I do not like needing a substance to just function normally. Mm -hmm. I don't like anything I need to rely on. For a time in the last year, it was my sleep, where if I didn't have eight hours, I was in my head and I would just do worse. I was like, this is not a good thing. And for a lot of people, and I think what might be me, Sue, I was like, was I relying on the gym for my happiness, for my mental health a little bit? And it was harder to assert it. Like now, I don't think as much as I used to be, but I know a lot of people are in that sense where if they don't get their workouts, it can send them into a very dark place. Like it can send them into honestly a little bit of a depression. I don't like throwing that word around too easily, but a lot of people I've talked to that take time off, get depressed like really, really low. Yeah. Not just bummed, not just sad. Like, oh, the Celtics 
lost, whatever it is, but get really, really low because of this. And I'm excited to test myself on that and say like, okay, was I relying on this a little mm -hmm. bit? It'll be interesting to find out. But I feel like, did, did you notice that when you took three months oh off? Oh my God. That your just overall happiness levels, did that One, get disrupted? 1,010%. And honestly, like my injuries put a lot into perspective in terms of putting all of my eggs in one basket. Well, in it. my life, if there was like one monumental thing that influenced me in such a way, like especially my overall mood and well-being. And like, I look at this too because you brought up the reliance piece of, I have depression, I have anxiety, I have OCD. I went through a point, and I'm team medication. I do not judge that, I do not stigmatize it. I was on medication for a while, but I was only relying on my medication for my depression and my OCD especially, mm -hmm. not doing anything else. And when I got to a point where we wanted to adjust that because it's like we need, I needed to do some more behavioral therapy, do other work because... I didn't re want to rely on it. When I adjusted my dose, my mental health plummeted. And I had a moment where I was like, I have no other mental health outlets. I have no other coping mechanisms. This is insane. Now I'm at a point where, you know, like I have a lot of other things mm. I do, a lot of therapy, behavioral therapy, where I have to take very little medication. So it's took, taken me so long to get there. But why I'm going off on this tangent is because it is never good to rely that heavily on one activity, one hobby, one piece of your life to influence your mood that much. It is never, never good. So it does put the, it puts it into perspective a lot because you're like, well, do I have anything else that can make me feel this way? Cause I probably should. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, did you, do you think you could have gotten to that point without that three month period or a, or a longer period that you went through? Do you think you would have arrived where you are today, realizing that and finding different ways to Oh, that get to where you that are. That was like my. Or do you think that wouldn't have come without that? I think I would have eventually, just because I feel like that comes with just getting older. I mean, this happened in my early twenties. I'm in mm -hmm. my. I was like in my mid late twenties now, so you don't have as many responsibilities when you're still in school. You don't have as much to focus on. So I think naturally, I would have started to realize that as I learned more about myself and had more autonomy in my life. But still, I don't think it would have been like that drastic like I, I was put in my place and how many people have those experiences in life where it's like i had to get here to realize this shit but i'm so better yeah. off be, like because of it i'm not yeah sometimes that's what it takes yeah yeah because this is what I mean, people don't realize i always say one of the most harsh or underrated truths that people don't talk about when talking about weight loss or when talking about going to stuff like this is that you're gonna have to deal with some weird emotions people don't tell you that and it sounds cheesy woo woo whatever mm -hmm. but that's something that i've learned over the last 10 years of coaching and working with more people is that is just as legitimate but such an under talked about piece of what's happening like when you're trying to lose weight you're gonna have to deal with emotions most people if you're feeling bored let's just go grab a snack if you're feeling stressed just order takeout feeling overwhelmed just to start next week you know what i'm saying you're gonna have to learn that you might have been using food to numb certain emotions that you weren't aware of it. I think in this case, you might have been using, not you specifically, but someone might be using activity, the gym, to numb certain emotions that they're going to have to find new healthy ways to deal with. Them. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. Yeah, That is really hard because now that you have all this time on your hands, you have nothing left to do but sit with them. And it can be a lot of different emotions, but that's something that's not talked about a lot when it comes to weight loss. It's not talked a lot about here. The, yeah. You know? And the gym and working out should always be a part of your mental health and having a good overall mood and well-being, but it should not be the reason for your good mood, your positive mental health and well-being. It should never be the reason because that's giving it way too much power and that means you're doing nothing else. So, I, and I think that, I feel like too, especially this can, another kind of almost reality check is when people will have to take a lot of time off because they worked out too much and that can psychologically make you really think and have to reframe your mind of I know I've had in, an injury an overuse injury of if I was actually prioritizing rest and I wasn't overworking myself and under eating 
I would not have to take these this month to two months off from the gym because I got this overuse injury. I would not be in this position. Now I have to yeah. reevaluate every single reason why I was approaching working out because how did I get here? But very helpful, like to put you in your place and be like, this has to change. And one of the mental models, the styles of thinking that helped me going into it, and I'm sure that even over the next few weeks, I'm going to come across things that I couldn't anticipate. But one of the mental frameworks, whatever you want to call it, that helped me going into it, that I was talking to my friend about, that I feel like a lot of people get bogged down on is what we even talked about before this is the incessant focusing on the things that you can do, not what you now can't do. And it's something that I've, it's one of the, the biggest, I don't say it's a character trait, but things that I've ingrained in my brain for the last four or five years that I think has led to a lot more success, a lot more happiness. Like when we lost all of our footage from Aloe, right? We spent how many thousands of dollars, you flying out to LA, us staying in Beverly Hills, recording every freaking hour of sunlight those days. And then for it to just be like wiped like that, mm -hmm. that could have swung really dark, really deep. Like, why do we even keep going? But it's like, okay, what is, it was like a Tom Brady. It, it was what, these athletes that I used to study with this. What did they say? So what now what? Like, no. so what this happened? Like now, what are we going to do? Yeah. Like focus on what you can do. Focusing on what you can't do is hard not to do, but it does nothing for you. It's not productive. It's not helping you. All it's doing is tearing you down. So for Aloe, right? Like we're just like, this freaking sucks. Let's take a day to be bummed. And then Tuesday, we're going to re-record. Yeah. In our studio, like we always do. So with this, it's like, I was even falling in this trap. I was focusing on and kind of worrying a little bit, but all the shit I could not do, all the movements, all the lifts, all the what's going to happen to my body, what's going to happen to this, all the things that I could not do. Because I mean, that takes up a good hour and a half, two hours of my morning, every morning, right? It's a staple in my routine. My brain feels more clear after I do it too. And then start to say, okay, well, this is stupid, but what are the things I can now do? For example, I would have 15 minute commute each way to the gym, about an hour, hour 15 workout with warm ups, five days a week. So I'm like, okay, that gives me 10 hours of free time that I did not have before. Okay. And a lot more mental energy because I'm not going to be drained after a workout. So I'm like, what are all, this is the big thing that I've got more excited about. If you're busy, which most people are, you have a list of things in your head that you've wanted to do, but you're like, you know what, when I'm just not as busy, I'll do it. Yeah. When life's not as crazy, I take, I'll do it then. And it took me to really dissect this and kind of journal down about it to be like, oh shit. Like I now don't have as much stuff to do. I'm now less busy, like reorganizing some budgeting pieces, starting a YouTube channel, cleaning, even dig deeper into piano, yeah. like all these small, stupid things that I've wanted to do for so long. All these things I wanted to do. I'm like, I have so much time to do this crap that I've genuinely wanted to do, but couldn't, or at least told myself I couldn't because I was too busy. And it got me so much more excited than like just focusing on what I can't do, which so many people do. And that mindset really changes the course of your day. It's like, I mean, I was thinking the same thing too, when you think about the psychological aspect, but when I like, I also, I was also thinking about it because it's funny. I do that every single morning I write down because I just like really bad anxiety and I ruminate a lot. And every single morning I've been doing this for the past like five years, I write down the first five things that I'm obsessing over that I can't control. Like I'll just write them down, can't control. And then I have to counter each one with something I can control. And it has to be related to what I can't. It, and if it can't be related, I'll just come up with something completely new. And then those five mm. things that I can control, that's what I'm focusing on. And I discard the others. And it doesn't mean my anxiety goes away, but it means that I'm able to be productive and my anxiety doesn't get in the way of me actually doing, of me actually being able to function in society because you get stuck on. And it's the same thing with getting stuck on these thoughts and these fears about not being able to work out. You get so stuck in it and you're not doing anything. You're not. Now that's not productive. Now that's actually devaluing your life and what you're doing and the type of person you're being. Let's put that energy into what we can do. So it doesn't mean that anything just disappears because I hate when people say, oh, it's just like, it's not me saying, oh, this is just how the anxiety and the issues go away. No, it's just a productive framing. It's a m mental health framework. And it's very, 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 very helpful because then you can look at the end of your day and you're like, oh, I survived this and I actually did this and this versus oh, all day. I just worried about not being able to go to the gym and how much weight I was going to gain, how much muscle I was going to lose. And it changes the way your brain thinks on a daily basis if you're consistent with that stuff. Yeah. 
like when I was younger, I was so resistant to the, what was that movie that was so cheese balls? The Secret. There's a book and a movie about the secret of, if you just think about it, it'll happen. If you dream it, it'll happen in real life, right? You have to manifest. And it, it went down a little bit too woo-woo mm -hmm. for me. And I just was so resistant to that style of thinking or for this example, like writing down the things you can control or not. Or when I was really low in a mental in my early 20s, like where, where my depression was probably at its all time highest. And I would force myself to like, look at something stupid, like a tree and write down as many beautiful things as I could find about it. And at first, this is what you're like, listen, like, it seems fake. And I felt fake doing it. Cause so I'm like, I don't actually think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like the pattern of the bark or the little trail of ants going up or the way this leaf sits on that leaf, like really paying it. It sounds fake yeah. and it felt fake and that killed me. But what I didn't realize and what I think you'd go through is that trains your brain to just think this way. Like your brain is plastic, you can change it. So if you train it, and at first it's gonna feel fake, I think that's where imposter syndrome partially comes from. At first it feels fake because your brain is not used to it, it's not normal, duh. But it trains your brain for that to become normal. So now it got to the point where I would just see beauty in random shit. And I was so much happier because of it, because my brain just did it without me having to intentionally go sit and look at a dumb tree or to write things down. Mm -hmm. It trains your brain to just do that automatically. And I don't think that's what I was so resistant to. So I know a lot of people are listening to this, like, oh, whatever. It's woo woo writing stuff down. It is so much powerful yeah. than you think. Yeah. It's unreal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Know. And I feel like that uh, like, identity crisis that people will run into is this helps avoid that a lot of if you go to the gym all the time, like some people just make it their entire personality. That's what you're like. Yeah. Your life yeah. revolves around the gym. A lot of people, that is the case, especially say if you're younger. That was one of the things I was worried about. I'm like, I do fitness online for a living. Yeah. I don't post gym stuff. <laughs> like this is pretty closely related to a part. I don't try to make what I do my identity at yeah. all. But I was like, that could be a little trap I fall into. Yeah. Like, this is what I do like, a little bit. Is that gonna step back and look at like, okay, obviously it may feel like this is my whole identity, but let's take a, take a step back and maybe it's actually not what can i focus on more of now i'm gonna get back to this but also i think something that's really helpful too if you are struggling with that identity crisis is look into your why behind you work out and go to the gym why are you doing this on a day-to-day -day basis and think about things that may be able to fulfill that why your reasoning somewhat it's not going to align perfectly but if you're doing it to feel good, feel energized, lower your fatigue, things like that, okay, maybe I'm going to start walking more or maybe I'm going to wake up and I'm going to adjust my morning routine a bit so that I feel more energized in the morning. I'm going to have a healthier breakfast. Focus on doing something else that could still make you feel fulfilled in that way so you don't completely lose that identity. And this can also force people to, if you're looking at your why and your why is I was only going to the gym because I want to look good and it's strictly aesthetics related which it's fine to have those goals but if it's only those goals okay maybe we have to reevaluate a bit because this is going to make it so much more difficult for me to not focus on how my body looks and have those issues with body dysmorphia while i can't work out my dream board is just a thousand pictures of sebum with a shirt off that's my only goal same i don't want to just look like sebum it's be sebum you inspired that actually i told y'all Mari, you think we text back and forth for sending each other studies, research? No, it's Mariana being like, oh my God, did you see Sebum? I just, the other day, them. She, I'm trying to, how do you think you got these vibrations? I want those. It's not a, it's not like, a, oh, I, I look up to him. It's like a, a chase. She's going to take mm -hmm. him down one day. Yeah. Watch it. And I was going to say, all of this is, I'm guessing now too, a lot easier said than done. This is easy to talk about, do it, like going through it gonna suck yeah i'm gonna next week when we film no i'm gonna do check-ins in the beginning before our video <laughs> before we film next week and we're gonna have a check-in with tony see how he's feeling what up you'll start to notice my thing. tone just a little more somber week to week just check it out i'll be sending like little hint through there no but it'll be interesting but like the the mental pieces don't neglect it because that could make or break mm -hmm. you a hundred so that's what to do you're taking time off the gym that's what to do. If you have any questions or to get in, again, if you're over on premium, we do a bonus episode where we're doing AMA, answering y'all's questions every single Friday. So we're gonna talk to y'all premium members this Friday. If you wanna join or sign up, that is five bucks a month. I'm not joking. It's literally five, what is $5 anymore? I don't think anything. I don't think my lot five dollars. five dollars. I don't think. No, it's like $8, oh, like a week. It's five bucks a month.
So that's AMAs. You also get access to all of our training programs. I think we got like six of them now, no matter your goals are. So we'll talk to y'all on Friday. Everybody else, we'll see y'all next Monday, as long as I make it, hopefully. Yeah. I just, I just quit. It's just me. Maybe I'll just start streaming Fortnite and become like a sketch jinxy streamer. Get a bunch of tattoos. Get off. a bunch of tattoos, wear like a white wife beater. Start streaming filming. Like the e-boys who gamer boys who just get I wish you could see my video game headset. I I, or, I was the only pink one on Amazon and it just looked like a pink headset. And it came and it has these freaking cat ears on it, like these little e-girl cat ears on it. But it's a good headset. Yeah. So I kept it. It's the opposite of e I, I'm a e-girl. Thank you for asking. Anywho, talk to y'all later. Uh